All right, welcome everyone to the PMNR podcast. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Darsha, a PMNR resident physician at Penn State Hershey. Uh, he's really interested in practicing precision and performance medicine via lifestyle and functional approaches. Uh, he's also uh, a TED speaker and the co-host of the Medicine Redefined podcast. Uh, Darsh is passionate about uh, development and creating value through social media uh, by sharing books, lifestyle advice, and perspective. And we're going to link all of Dr. Uh, Dr. Darsh's social media platforms uh, and link it uh, below. So be sure to give him a follow and just want to say welcome. Yeah, thanks, Tony, man. It's, it's uh, awesome to be here. Um, like you said, I'm just here hopefully to inspire and motivate some students. Uh, glad to be part of the PM&R uh, group. And so hopefully listeners get some get some value out of this, right? So excited. Absolutely. We appreciate that. And we always like to start off every uh, podcast asking, how did you discover PM&R? Yeah, so I initially learned about PM&R when I was a freshman in college. And I was actually at UPMC, I believe. Um, And I didn't really know what it was. I was just there for a week shadowing different specialties, different days. And so I hopped into PM&R. I really did not even know what it stood for. And I believe I was shadowing a speech therapist at the time uh, with a brain injured patient. And I look back and it's funny how I like know all these details now, but in the moment, I wasn't very interested at all. I was just there to shadow. Um, And I wasn't, it didn't really strike me as something that I wanted to do in the future. I was like, okay, this is cool, you know, we're, we're doing speech therapy um, to somebody with aphasia. And since that time, it was like, okay, whatever, it's off my radar. Then I go through medical school and then third year clinical rotations. I did my first rotation doing OB-GYN. And you know how all the residents kind of ask the students, hey, what, what are you interested in? What are you interested in going into? And at the time, you know, I knew I wanted to do some sort of lifestyle, alternative, holistic medicine. And I was thinking GI because the microbiome, there was a huge boom going on. There were a lot of articles and data coming out about it. So I was like, you know what? I think I want to do GI and then somehow link that into lifestyle, gut microbiome, whatnot. And after I told the chief resident kind of, you know, what I was interested in, he was like, why haven't you thought of PM&R? And in my head, you know, a light bulb goes off and I'm like, why haven't I thought of that? You know, I, I love working out. I'm really into exercise physiology. Um, doing procedures seemed pretty cool. And then just learning more about it, I was like, wow, this is like an art and a science. It, it really goes with my values. I love to life coach and motivate. Um, it's nothing too acute, which, you know, I really don't like, but it's more chronic and you can actually develop that re- rapport, right, with your patients. And so I shadowed it. I did an elective rotation in it in my third year, fell in love with it. So all the different components. And then I decided, all right, fourth year, I'm going to do my audition rotations and applied full on. And uh, here I am. That's awesome to hear, man. It's, uh, it's always it's always nice to hear how well connected it is to mm-hmm. have been sort of uh, getting up towards, towards medical school. And it yeah. seems like it's kind of like that perfect uh, next stop to everything that you're doing. Right. Exactly. So a little bit, a little bit more specifically, what's uh, what's been the highlight so far throughout your residency program? Man, what has been the highlight? I, you know what? Honestly, I didn't think I'd be doing as many procedures as I have been. And, you know, I'm, I'm at Penn State, and I think that's something unique to our program. Um, and I know a lot of other programs also do a lot of procedures. But I guess going into pm and I really didn't realize how hands-on. Um, I would be. So doing things like Botox injections, ultrasound injections, um, going to the surgical center, uh, doing spinal epidurals, things like that, right? Just really being hands-on. And to me, it was actually kind of shocking how much I enjoyed that because I really thought I would just do clinical medicine, um, not really do any type of intervention. And now I'm kind of thinking about the future and I'm like, man, I would really love to do Botox. I would really love to uh, do some sort of injections. I, I, I do get a thrill out of that. It's fun. Um, so that's kind of just been the highlight is actually trying to figure out what you like, right? I think in medical school, there's just so much coming at you that you know you have time, but yet you're still trying to figure out exactly what it is you want to do. But then when you get to residency and you're actually in it and you're starting to plan the next five years, 10 years, and you're just thinking down the road, it starts to become more real. And I think while you're in it, you start to realize like, okay, this is something I definitely want to include in my practice. So if we if you were to talk to somebody who uh, is interested but may not know too much about it, what would your uh, what would you say to recommend the field of PMN? Yeah, um, yeah. It's, so it's a multifaceted approach to this to this question because there's a lot. So the first I would recommend is 
getting the shadowing in, right? I think almost everyone would say that and not just shadow one day in PM&R, but see different aspects of it, right? One of the beauties of PM&R is that it's so diverse that there's sports and spine where it's very interventional and there's like sports medicine and cancer rehab, um, which can be more multidisciplinary. Then you have inpatient, right? The spinal cord, the strokes, the brain injury. Uh, you have spasticity. There's just so much that you can do with it, right? And different programs, different regions of the U.S. will sometimes specialize in, in, in different things. And you'll see that. So first advice is go out, shadow, and see whether you would fit in kind of with that, right? Because it's more chronic. A lot of people who like ER, they obviously will not like PM&R because it's not as acute. So understanding like, hey, is this what I want for my patient population? Second piece of advice that kind of dovetails on that is, is this something where you will see every patient differently, right? I think that goes for any specialty. Whenever somebody's interested in a specialty, you need to look at every patient differently because that's what's going to give you the thrill. That's what's going to get you the extra mile to go and, 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 and search what's wrong with your patients or finding that next treatment, right? That you're not going to say, oh, this patient I've already had, this is just like this patient, we're going to do the same exact thing. It might be the case, but it's the mindset that you approach that patient. Third, I would say go to the AAPM&R website. I think they do a phenomenal job for medical students, uh, pre-meds, and they kind of have a roadmap too, as far as what year you are and what you should be doing and different resources like books and websites as far as how to gain interest in it. I think our conferences are awesome too. So if anyone you know is able to go to the conferences, there's a huge med student crowd that goes, um, you can definitely learn more about that. And then lastly, the personality fit, you know, it, it really does matter. Um, and so, you know, us PM&R, we're not super, super type A. Um, I think everyone's type A in medicine, but we're probably like the type Bs of, 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 uh, of medicine. So uh, it's more of a relaxed environment for what I found. More of the colleagues I talk to, they're just very friendly. Um, so it's just, it, it, there's really that personality match that goes along with it. Um, so what I would say overall is don't discount pm &R. It's one of those fields that has a branch to every single thing in medicine. And, you know, I honestly think the next generation of doctors is looking to be more generalized and being a doctor first before being a specialized physician, right? I think there's been a push in, you know, in, in past years where you, you specialize, you specialize, if you're going to go general surgery, you need to either do like, you know, plastics, cardiothoracic, something. Um, and that's why we've seen primary care take a dip. But I think we're now starting to see that pendulum reverse. And PM&R, while it may be a specialization, you know, we always talk about what is PM&R, right? It's an interview question you're going to get. And everyone says you should answer and, and, and the word function has to be in there, right? You, you want to optimize function. But what does that truly mean? Function is living everyday life. It's, it's living life, right? So we're essentially looking at how do we allow patients to live to their fullest? So you know, every action that they take is going to be vital to that. The way they sleep, okay, well, there's some neuro and psych components to that. The way they eat, okay, well, there's GI, there's going to be heart, you know, cardiac stuff. The way they exercise, okay, that's MSK, that's ortho, that's also cardiac. Um, stress management, right? That's also psych. And then they go out into the real world, right? So, oh, wait, now there's allergies. So there's rheumatology. So our hands are kind of in this, you know, everywhere in the pot. Um, of course, we specialize more in the neuro and MSK. But that's what I love about PM&R, you know, kind of bringing it back um, is that don't I would I would tell med students not to discount PM&R just because it's a baby between MSK and neuro, but that, man, you can do so much with it. It's really up to you how you want to choose your path. Absolutely. And as a, as a visiting student at, at Penn State for this past month, um, I definitely can, I can speak towards just getting exposure to every little uh, every different corner, every aspect of the field. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything to share about your program uh, at Penn State Hershey? Man, it's been it's been awesome. It's it's such a family vibe, um, which I love. It's a smaller program, right, where we have four residents per year. And you know, here's another advice that I would give to med students that that ties back to this is that there's a book called Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker. I have it somewhere up there. It's an orange book in that top shelf. Uh, but essentially, it's a book that takes you through understanding what your leadership skills are, what your strengths are, and what your weaknesses are, and how in what environment would you succeed. And so a lot of people, when they go through life and they go through studies, they look at prestige, right? That's like one of the most common things, especially for us in medicine. It's, oh, I want to go to the top. I want to go to the top. But the top doesn't always necessarily 
mean brand name. And it doesn't also always necessarily carry the same fit and value uh, for, for you, right? And I could have gone to a program with 10, 12 people, but it wouldn't have fit me. I do much better in a smaller program, you know, uh, with, with four. And I've learned that through reading that book. Um, and it's, it's a, it makes it better for me to be in a leadership position. Um, and it makes me kind of be more involved with patients, with the program itself. Um, so I highly recommend that book. But yeah, Penn State's been great overall. I mean, I love our call schedule. Um, everyone's super family oriented, like I mentioned. Uh, there was a lot of understanding, especially during COVID times about the stress. Wellness is a huge, huge um, attribute here. Uh, so overall, it's been great. I can definitely attest to, to, the, to the friendliness and, and the culture of the, of the uh, staff and the residents there. It's been an awesome month. Uh, we'll definitely have to link that book that you described yeah. in the description as well. So I'll be sure to do that. And speaking of your residency experience, do you have any funny stories that you might want to share uh, that you've had so far? You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to think if there's anything funny. So I mean, PM&R in itself, you're going to have crazy patient experiences, like fun ones, right? I think PM&R has some of the best patient population because if you ever watch the uh, Doctor Glocko Flecken, the ophthalmologist guy, you know the the humor um, videos that he makes, like he does the PM&R one. And at the end of it, he's like, we're PM and R and our patients love us. And it's like, yeah, that's so true. So I've had really just like fun encounters with patients. Um, some of them just, you know, messing around with you, very satirical. And they know they can like mess around with you um, because they're in good spirits. They know they're coming in for their Botox and they'd be like, oh, I'm going to be in some pain, but I know I'm going to feel better right after. Or, um, you know, they, they just have this understanding that we're here to heal rather than kind of just treat. You know, so I think the that's what I look forward to as a resident, honestly, is just meeting newer and newer patients and just kind of having those interactions. That's so true, too, because they won't come back if it wasn't working. So they're always exactly. obviously something's yeah. going right. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to take a, a slight transition, kind of uh, a little bit asking a little bit more advice on uh, any tips that you might give students who are looking to match into PMR. So um, we got the interest going with students uh, turning their gears towards PMR, but now yeah. the important part is how to match into it. And, as you know, yeah. it's gotten a little bit more competitive. Um, <laughs> uh, just to start, with that, yeah, any advice to start off with? Yeah, it's it's funny, man. It's gotten so competitive. I remember applying to seventeen programs, and I thought I was a stellar candidate, you know, at that time. And if I were applying in this cycle, it, <laughs> I don't know if I'd match, honestly. So I'd have to apply to probably fifty, sixty, seventy programs just to keep up. Um, so it's cool to see that the interest is there. Uh, the best way, honestly, I think to stand out is. Being yourself, but also having a vision and a mission in mind, right? So I, like I mentioned, a lot of times in medical school, we're just bombarded with kind of what we want to do, but also thinking ahead, not, not necessarily knowing exactly what fellowship or what you want to like exactly do what your title should be, but understanding this is the mission I have in mind. This is how I want to create value. These are the things that I am interested in. And it's okay to have an open mind during your interview, but I think it's super it shows when somebody has clearly thought like, this is why I'm going to PM&R. I don't know if I want to do sports med or this or cancer rehab, but this is the patient population I kind of want to work with. And this is how I feel like I can make the biggest difference in the field, right? So a lot of times people will focus on what they've done and which is great. You know, I think everyone's looking at resumes and things like that just to show like, hey, do you have exposure and do you have experience? But it's like, okay, well, taking that, now what do we do moving forward? And if you can have that forward thinking approach, I think people will start to see like, oh, I would love to have this person in my program because they're already forward thinking. They're thinking short term. They're thinking long term. They know how to navigate uh, their, their own mindset, their own emotions, maybe. And I think that's just a huge plus. Um, the other thing is honestly just staying true to yourself, right? Um, if, if you don't know something, not coming across as if, you know, you're, you're the candidate that you're not, you know what I mean? A lot because it's so competitive, a lot of times we'll kind of get that imposter syndrome and say, oh, well, why would I match up? I'm one of like 550. And then because of that, we try to compensate ourselves. And I, I just don't think there's a need for that, um, especially virtually. You know, it can be a little tougher um, for both sides, the program and the candidate. So I think really just kind of being yourself and then asking questions. You know, I, I say this all the time, especially um, during the virtual season, a, a lot of times it's tough to get those questions out because you feel like you're just talking nonstop. 
But if you were in person, it'd be a lot easier because you could read the social cues, you know when you're talking too much, you can ask a question here and there. And it's tough to do that virtually. So I think people understand that. And you can always preface by like, hey, I'm not trying to like talk too much, but I have like all these questions. I know we're virtual. So just let me know, like, is, it, is there an appropriate time that I can run through these or something? Because I think it's super important to understand the program, understand the fit, understand the call schedule, understand the vacation schedule. These little things are going to make or break the culture and your fit, right? Because overall, most of you guys, like as you go into residency, most residents get the same experience, right? Some might be a little procedure heavy. Some might be MSK heavy, things like that. But overall, that fit matters. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. And you you sort of uh, segue perfectly into the next uh, topic I was going to ask. What what are your personal thoughts on everything being virtual? I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> so like, yeah. I think I think there's I, I get it, right? I mean, there's a huge component of saving money, uh, which is huge. You guys don't have to travel as much, and um, if you're applying to 60 programs, though, it's it's a lot of balance, right? Because people are applying to 60 programs, if it were in person, they would not be able to go to, let's say, 40 interviews, right? You would then be have to pick and choose. So that actually leaves more interview spots open for other people. But when you're virtual, you essentially don't have to go to the meeting to read the night before, right? Like you can just stick to interviews um, and you could do 40 of them, or you could do 30 of them. So then, yeah, you could be technically stealing spots, right? Quote unquote, stealing spots from other candidates. I think from a understanding point of view, like if I want to understand a candidate, it is almost impossible to do virtually, especially in 20, 30 minutes. But if I have somebody in front of me, I can tell non-verbally, you know, how interested are they? Is this a good fit for them? How are they talking to the residents? Are they looking around? Um, or are they here just because they applied here? You know what I mean? So there's, I think there's way more cues that you get in person. And this is the other thing. As a resident, you're going to be doing three to four years for PM&R. That's a lot. That's a big portion of your life, honestly, especially during medical training. Going and seeing that place, understand the facility, that again can make or break your experience there. If it's a fellowship and it's a one-year ordeal, it's a little different, right? You can survive anywhere for a year. Um, but when you talk about three to four years, I think it's important to at least see the see the place. Absolutely, and it's a heavy decision too. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot, a lot of residents start families during that time, get married during that time. A lot yeah. of life uh, big changes. Uh, did you have anything like that going on when you were deciding when you were starting residency? Yeah, absolutely. So at the time, my uh, my now wife, we were engaged um, at that point, and you know, for her work, she's not in the medical field, so she was applying um, to like different corporate companies and stuff. Uh, and the pandemic ended up. We obviously had twenty twenty when I matched. We didn't know how what was going to happen with the pandemic. Um, luckily, she's virtual and she can work from home, so it's been okay. You know, being here in Hershey, and she does travel. You know, back and forth. Um, to Boston and things like that. So yeah, I mean, those things we did have to take an account for and say, hey, do we need to be in a bigger city? Are we okay going out into like the suburbs like Hershey? Or do we need to be somewhere where you can commute? So those were really big factors, um, especially during COVID time. So that's, uh, yeah, it's big decisions, big decisions yeah. during a very stressful time. Um, yeah. you, you had a, a little bit about the social meeting greets and that, uh, I, I don't know if I don't know if you've heard yet, but at least uh, from my perspective, hearing from some of my classmates, those have kind of been hit or miss in terms of even from our perspective how we perceive the program. Uh, mm. Some of some have been extremely awkward. <laughs> some have been uh, honestly just like I feel like for me personally, uh, it's a great way to see the program, but at the same time, it could also be uh, a way to maybe see some aspect of the program that you weren't really expecting to see. Um, Based off of that, what advice would you give on how to best tackle these social media greets? Yeah, so it comes down to how many people you're having the social media greet with, right? I think about six is the average with six other candidates, and then you might have like two to four to five residents that you're kind of doing the social media greets with. Now, last year, Penn State, we did it the night before, um, but now we're doing it in the middle of the interview that way we can free up the night for the residents as well as the candidates and it's kind of just all one shot which i like better because things are fresher in the mind for the candidates they can actually learn about the program and then ask follow-up questions to the residents to get more honesty and more transparency so i definitely like that a lot better uh the benefit of kind of having it the night before was like hey you could have a beer you know you could open up whatever you want it, it's a, it was a little bit more relaxed you were in your home you weren't as stressed, right? After just being an interview, because your mind's kind of thinking, wait, did I mess up? Did I say the right thing? What was that question they asked again? So there's there's little differences in that. 
again, what I tell the candidates when I'm on these meet and greets is first thing is like, hey, ask as many questions as you want. This is your time. Because after this, sure, I'm, I'm willing to hop on a call with any candidate that's applying. That's, you know, I'm very, I love doing this kind of stuff. And so I volunteer my time all, always. Um, but a lot of people won't email or they won't go on social media and contact or anything, right? So they think, oh, this is it. This is my time. So I say, ask all your questions now <laughs> or, you know, forever hold your peace in a way. Um, so ask, ask those questions. Um, the other thing I would say is ask strategic questions, right? So like if you are trying to really understand a program, the weaknesses are huge, right? So asking like, hey, what is one thing that you guys would change about your program? Um, how has the culture evolved since you've been there? Understanding are they PGY2, 3, or 4, right? And I think having a good mix uh, is important because it shows that no matter what year you are, they're giving you time out of the day. At least, and this is again during the day, not at night. Taking time during the day to talk to residents because it's an, because recruitment's important to them. But it also shows that hey, they have more free time during the day. They're not doing something super super vital where they have to do with patients or something. Um, another question I always recommend asking is seeing do majority of residents go into fellowship or do they go general, right? And I think having a good balance there um, is key because it shows the it shows that the institution has a really good foundation where people feel um, good enough to just go general, general physiatry. Uh, but then they also have enough avenues and enough training where they feel comfortable to apply to fellowship. Um, one of the common questions we get asked is, why did you pick Hershey, right? Or why did you rank it number one? And it's interesting because a lot of people will just answer that. But it's important to realize not everyone goes to their number one program. You know, I'll be transparent. I did not rank Hershey number one. And I wish I did. I wish I ranked it higher for all the aforementioned um, reasons. Um, so I'm super transparent when it comes to talking about how I ranked, why I ranked, and then what, what I wish I did, right? And I think that's the key. If somebody says like, oh, I, did, I, did, I actually didn't rank this program high, but then they don't give a reason as to why they wish they did or what, what it was, you know, that's kind of like, okay, well, I want to know a little bit more about that, right? And so that's where I think I would tell candidates, don't be afraid to email after, go on social media after, um, and ask the people in the meet and greets for, for more information, because most of us would be happy enough to, to give you guys the honest like truth and, and be transparent. Absolutely. And, and I feel like transparency, just like kind of what you mentioned earlier, you, people can tell people can tell whether or not you're being transparent or being honest. Um, so speaking on that, what are uh, what are the things in a program that students should look out for when they're applying or when they're sending in their uh, applications? Yeah, um, the first thing I think is the cultural fit. Like you, you need to be happy with where you are. Even if it's like a top program and you're going to get all the procedures you want and you know you want to do pain medicine and you're going to do so much pain medicine there. If you're not happy there, it doesn't matter. So you have to go to a place that fits your values, right? Here at Hershey, very family oriented, smaller fit, smaller program. We can all joke around. I know the attendings very well. They know me. I love that. That's what I want. Some people may not want that. Some people want to be a small fish in a big pond or a big fish in a big pond, right? And they want to go to a bigger program where there's more research, there's more academic stuff. That's completely fine. You have to realize if that's your fit. Um, so that's kind of the first thing I'd say is you have to find a cultural fit. Number two is knowing where you are in life and what's going to happen in the next three to four years, right? So we talked about, are you planning a family? You know, um, are you a lot, you know, a lot of time frees up after that intern year. I travel international all the time. So for me, it's like very important to go out and travel. So I need vacations that are separated. My intern year, I had two weeks and two weeks together. And it stunk. It's, it sucked, honestly, because my wife can't take off two weeks in a row. So one week we do something and then the other week I'm kind of left alone. So having four separate weeks, very critical. A nice call schedule, you know, for me, that was huge. I, we're going to get into this, you know, having a podcast, doing a lot of social media. I need that time outside of work in order to build that, in order to do that, because that's going to be a bulk of what I do after residency. So knowing that not all my time is just bound down to Penn State Hershey is nice, right? And they also respect that and balance that and they promote what I do. So it's nice knowing that I have backing from the program. Um, and then lastly, of course, you wanna look at the academics, right? Are you, if you are interested in procedures or pain medicine or sports, like how many prior residents have matched into those fellowships, right? What's kind of the guidance? Is there an alumni network? Are they okay with you reaching out 
how do the attendings kind of help help you and help navigate your path into what you want to do next? So understanding that's very important. If you want if you want to do pain medicine, but you're going to a program where they might only have one procedure month throughout your whole three years, well, you know, you're not going to be a stellar candidate looking at pain then, right? So I think all of those, it, it really depends on the person, but all four of those matter. And having a world class yeah. factory right next door uh, is is a, is a good for like. Absolutely. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And lastly, you know, I forgot to mention, we talked a little bit about this offline, but like the program coordinator, right, is huge. I won't forget my interview day. We, so, you know, Penn State, there's like two different entrances, right? There's like the outpatient side, like PEDS, and then there's uh, the main entrance into like the inpatient rehab. And so during my interview day, we all park near the inpatient rather than the program coordinator's office where like the interviews were going to take place. And so we were lost and, you know, we, we ended up emailing her and she like found us and she like walked outside. It must have been like 35 degrees at this time, 40 degrees. And she like comes and gets us. And she's like, just to let you know, not every program coordinator is going to do this. Like, I'm just going to come out and get you guys. And we're like, all right, wow. Like that's, that's impressive. Um, but shout out to Michelle. I mean, she's been an amazing program coordinator um, at Penn State. And she's actually given talks at conferences. So last year, AAP in New Orleans, she's given talks to other program coordinators as far as recruitment goes um, and kind of what to look for, how to do it. So she's very active on Twitter. She just wrote another Twitter tip Tuesday or something it's called for residents or for um, med students that are applying. So for those of you guys who are not on Twitter, you should honestly go and just follow Michelle because she gives so much good advice out there for applications. Um, but she makes she makes her program run, honestly. So. A hundred percent. I mean, it's, I feel like it's kind of rare to ever hear residents sort of uh, give love or even speak about their coordinators. But, you know, that's one thing I felt like uh, I felt immediately. Um, you know, I, for me, at least, for, I think from the perspective of a student applying and doing visiting rotations and whatnot, you know, you have the program director and you have the residents who are like the face of the program. But that initial contact, the, the voice of the program is the program coordinator. And uh, it's, you know, just, uh, I, I echo everything that you said. It's it's been an absolute pleasure to 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 meet and to be able to work with Michelle. And it's been a, an album month, a large part for her. And one cool thing that she did for me, uh, she sent me a list of her favorite places and favorite things to do around the area. Which I was just like, that's amazing. And it was very yeah. detailed with their tabs and um, just a, that energy and that effort for a visiting student. You know, it's it's incredible. Um, yeah, so she's glad to, very invested. Yeah, very invested, yeah. not even only in the residents, the program, but also the med students, right? Like she's just invested in this whole PMR world, uh, which is awesome to see. And the uh, role of the coordinator is very important from my understanding during the route residency, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So whenever it comes to things like conferences, they're the ones that are going to set that up. When it comes to understanding what your journal club is, all the meetings that you have with different attendings, the presentations that you're going to have, uh, which students are going to be rotating with you. So she pretty much manages our Outlook calendar, right? Even when it comes to call and stuff, knowing if you're going to have a switch, um, even things like holiday parties and uh, graduation. So pretty much anything you can think of, like Michelle's got a hand in it. Um, and I don't know if that's true across across the nation for other programs where the program coordinator does all that. Um, but I know at Penn State, it's been, yeah, Michelle's kind of running our, run our show, which has been very, very awesome to see. A little tangent about what you said earlier. Where do you travel? Where do you like to travel internationally? So, man, we've got we've kind of gone everywhere. Um, well, I shouldn't say everywhere. So let's see. Next up is Colombia, Mexico City. Uh, just went to Greece in September. Before that, went to Spain in March. Last year, did it Austria and the year and Italy, southern Italy. Um, and then we have India coming up next year as well for a wedding. And I think that's it for now. I can't even, I, <laughs> there's so many times where I'm like, wait, what have we done? Um, yeah, I think that's it for now in terms of international. So we've got some coming up too. So Northern Italy next year as well. That's awesome. And it's always good to hear that um, the lifestyle of the residents, it seems like you guys have a lot of freedom to to do what you need to do and to get really, uh, to not burn out and to keep that, yeah. that focus 100%. going. Yeah. 100%. Yeah.